Rev up your engine! Yes, all good things have to come to an end. This is the last car I'm repairing in Houston, Texas. I'm gonna repair them someplace else too, but this is the absolute last one I am fixing in Houston, Texas. So here we go with a little advice on how to fix cars when they're not running right. Infiniti G37 will go under the hood. The check engine light is on. It's got PO300. That's one of the hardest codes to decipher. I got my scan tool. It had the PO301 code. It didn't have any other codes, but that's a real stinker of a code because it's random intermittent misfire. Tons of things can cause it. So what I did was, after I recorded all the data that was there from the freeze frame, I erased the trouble code. It says, do you want to erase the code? Yes, yes, and it erased the codes. Then I started it up. We're still running poor. I got half a block down the street and the check engine light's flashing on, off, on, off, and then it stays on. Now when your check engine light flashes, that means that the engine is running so poorly it can damage the catalytic converter, so that makes it flash. So I thought, great, well at least it's found one big problem right off the bat. And that's kind of lucky. Normally you got to drive them a lot further than that. And then when I plugged it in, here's what I got. PO301. That is cylinder number one misfire. Now why wasn't that in the codes, but it was just PO300? When you have a problem in one cylinder, the misfires will often start in other cylinders too because the computer tries to compensate and then it starts messing up the other cylinders. So, we're gonna try the most obvious thing, which is this. I'm gonna change the ignition coil on number one and the spark plug. Because as I said, this is the last car that I'm fixing in Houston. I don't want it to be the head gasket starting to blow and this whole engine gets torn down because I don't have time for that. We'll take the stupid beauty cover off and we got to find cylinder number one. Well, that's real easy. So you got to take some of this cramp off to get to it. Let's just say these engineers don't make these vehicles easy to work on. So we're going to have to take this plastic cramp out of the way because it's blocking the access. Where to let it? Off it comes. Now we got some working room. Pull that out of the way. And this other squeeze clamp. And we're also gonna have to pull this hose out of the way. It's in the way too. Now we can access the coil. Coil's right there. 10 millimeter, we'll pop it out. Then we'll check the new one with the old one. They got the same three wires and they got the same connectors. Sometimes these connectors are different. You must make sure it's the correct one. And since we're taking it apart, we might as well change the spark plug too. So we get the socket for the spark plug and hook it up. This one was stuck in, so I got my magnet on a stick. You can see it's misfiring badly. Not a good sign. And this is one reason I say not to buy these Infinities used, like my customer did. You can see, it's got a lot of carbon buildup on it. New one you can see has none. The engine's flat wearing out. It's burning oil, shorting stuff up. My advice is to get rid of this thing soon. Don't try to drive it too long. I've had customers with these that wanted to keep them. And then once a year, I had to change all the six spark plugs. It was kind of a pain. And eventually, even then, they didn't run right. But I'm gonna change this spark plug in a coil and see what happens. So in goes the new spark plug. First, you twist it by hand until it's snug. Get your ratchet and get it nice and tight. A few times and then, now it's snug. Put the new ignition coil in, it just pops in the hole, as you can see. Just wiggles in, get a little wiggle. Then connect the electrical connection and bolt it in. Then we'll put this hose back on here. We'll put this one in first. Because it's hard to get on. And it's all old cracked rubber, so it's not much fun putting these things on. Then we'll bolt it in place so it doesn't wiggle. Another 10 millimeter. Don't forget to squeeze these stupid clamps back on so they're tight and they won't suck air. Now before we put the rest back on, let's start it up. Look how smooth it's idling now. That fixed it for the time being. We'll put the stupid beauty cover back on. Go close the hood, take it for a ride. We'll disconnect the scan tool. We don't need that anymore. This thing's old, so it doesn't have a backup camera. <laughs> but, it doesn't shake anymore. It was really running poorly. Well, when I accelerated hard last time, it didn't make it half a block, and the engine started to bog down and the check engine light came on. I gotta watch it, it's raining now. 
it's flashing the traction control, but <laughs> no check engine light yet. Well, that it now has full power since one cylinder wasn't working before. There's no one around now, so we'll floor it. You can see it's spinning those wheels. It's got tons of power. That was the traction control shutting it down because it was spinning too fast. But as you see, there's no check engine light anymore. And instead of shaking and idling like crap, you can't even feel it shaking on the shifter when it's sitting there. Not at all. That fixed it. Hurrah! But alas, it's only a temporary fix because you saw all that burnt carbon on the number one spark plug. That means the engine is internally worn, the pistons, the valve seals. So it's now burning oil, which eventually will clog up the engine. And eventually, of course, the piston rings would break and it wouldn't run at all. It's a long way from that, but unless she wants to be changing the spark plugs every six months or a year, Probably a good time to say, time to move on to another car. So that's it. The last repair I ever did for a customer. My old garage here in Houston, Texas. Don't worry, I'm gonna be fixing them in Tennessee. Where I'm gonna be doing the same thing. We got a lot of hills there. I can have fun with my Triumph motorcycle going through the twisties. So it's goodbye Texas and hello Tennessee. And here's some bonus questions and answers. Madman says, how are the 1980s Camaros? My dad owned one with the Iron Duke back in the 80s. He's feeling nostalgic and wants to get a 1984 Camaro with the V8. All right, uh, they were better made in the early 80s. So an 84 could be okay. Now, the later 80s and early 90s, they made all kinds of crap in those things. They were some of the worst vehicles ever made. If you get late 80s, early 90s American cars, a lot of them were absolute junk. The Japanese were eating them up in terms of competition. They couldn't figure out how to make front wheel drive vehicles. They had problems meeting the anti-pollution specifications. They had all kinds of problems. But if you go to 84, they were still reasonably built. If I was him, I'd go even earlier, you know, try to get a 70s. The 70s are more collectible and they were much more solid built. The older you go, the better they actually were made. The only problem that you got to realize is where are you? Where's the car coming from? Like I had one the other day, a guy brought it over to my garage. Excellent. I said, do you know the history of this car? And he says, yeah, it's always been registered in Harris County, which is the county that Houston is in Texas. Cars really don't rust here. I looked under their solid frame, solid as could be, great vehicle. But let's say if you live in Cleveland, Detroit, Buffalo, whatever, that frame's gonna be rotten away and it's gonna be an endless pile of junk. Never buy a vehicle that has frame rot. It's not worth it because the whole thing is gonna be rotten. If the frame's rotten, everything else is too because the frame is the thickest steel. And if that's rotten, the rest of the steel's all rotten too. So stay away from old rusted cars. Mitsubishi for life says Scotty. How can I buy an aftermarket ace and automatic transmission for my car? Transmissions are designed by engineers to fit certain engines, certain cars, the drivetrain, bolt on. You can't take one type of transmission out on your car and put an ace in and bolt it up. The software won't jive with the computer that shifts it. It's very complex stuff. You really just can't do that anymore. I mean, uh, when I was young, guys would do stuff like, oh man, I've only got a three-speed standard. I want a four-speed standard because back in the day, four-speed was the big thing. Now they got eight speeds, but back in the day, four-speed was, oh yeah, I got a four on a floor. And you could bolt stuff off and bolt on another one. Maybe you had to weld some mounts on, but it wasn't that hard to do. But with modern automatic transmissions, you can't take the one you have out in your car, put a different one in. It would be one gigantic rat's nest, and it may never work. Probably wouldn't even bolt up to the engine because there's so many different designs. And then even if you got it bolted on, the computer wouldn't know how to make it shift because it's a different type of transmission. Don't try it. Buy a car that already has an ASIN transmission in it. Don't try swapping yours out if it doesn't have one now. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.